The cliff face of Tmolos watches half the Mediterranean. It falls away to Sardis on one side, and on the other to the village of Hypaipa. Pan lives in a high cave on that cliff. He was amusing himself, showing off to the nymphs, thrilling them out of their airy bodies with the wild airs he breathed through the reeds of his flute. Their ecstasies flattered him. Their words, their exclamations flattered him. But the flattered become fools. And when he assured them that Apollo, no less, stole his tunes and rearranged his rhythms, it was a shock for Pan to find himself staring at the great god, hanging there in the air off the cave mouth, half eclipsed with black rage, half beaming with a friendly challenge. Tmolos the mountain, suggested the god, can judge us. Tmolos shook out his hair, freed his ears of bushes, trees, birds, insects, then took his place at the seat of judgment, binding his wig with a whole oak tree the acorns clustering over his eyebrows, and announced to Pan, your music first. It so happened Midas was within hearing, collecting nuts and berries. Suddenly he heard music that froze him immobile as long as it lasted. He did not know what happened to him as Pan's piping carried him off filled him with precipices, lifted him on weathered summits, poured blue icy rivers through him, hung him from the stars, replaced him with a fluorescent earth, spinning and dancing on the jet of a fountain. It stopped, and Tmolus smiled, as if coming awake. Back, he thought, hugely refreshed from a journey through himself. But now he turned to Apollo, the great, bright god. As he turned, all his forest dragged like a robe. Apollo was serious. His illustrious hair burst from under a wreath of laurel, picked only moments ago on Parnassus. The fringe of his cloak of Tyrian purple was all that touched the earth. In his left hand, the lyre was a model in magical code of the earth and the heavens. Ivory of narwhal and elephant, diamonds from the interiors of stars. In his right hand, he held the plectrum that could touch every wavelength in the universe, singly or simultaneously. Even his posture was like a tone, like a tuning fork, vibrant, alerting the whole earth, bringing heaven down to listen. Then the plectrum moved, and Tmolos, after the first chords, seemed to be about to decompose among the harmonics. He pulled himself together, but it was no use. He was helpless, as the music dissolved him, and poured him through the snakes and ladders of the creation and the decreation of the elements, and finally, bringing the sea horizon to an edge clean as a knife, restored him to his shaggy, crumpled self. Pan was humbled. Yes, he agreed. Apollo was the master. Tmolos was correct. The nymphs gazed at Apollo. They agreed. But then a petulant voice, a hard-angled, indignant, differing voice, came from behind a rock. Midas stood up. The judgment, he cried, is ignorant, stupid, and merely favours power. Apollo's efforts are nothing but interior decoration by artificial light, for the chic, the effete, Pan is the real thing, the true voice of the subatomic. 
Apollo's face seemed to writhe momentarily as he converted this clown's darkness to light, then pointed his plectrum at the ears that had misheard so grievously. Abruptly those ears lolled long and animal, on either side of Midas' impertinent face. Revolving at the root, grey-whiskered, bristly, the familiar ears of a big ass. The king, feeling the change, grabbed to hang on to his ears. Then he had some seconds of pure terror, waiting for the rest of his body to follow. But the ears used up the power of the plectrum. This was the god's decision. The king lived on, human, wagging the ears of a donkey. Midas crept away. Every few paces he felt at his ears and groaned. He slunk back to his palace. He needed comfort. He was bitterly disillusioned with the spirit of the wilderness. He hid those ears in a turban superb as compensation could be. But a king needs a barber. Sworn to secrecy or impalement, the barber, wetting his lips, clipped around the grisly roots of the great angling ears, as if the hair there might be live nerve ends. What he was staring at, and having to believe, was worse for him than for their owner, almost. He had to hide this news as if it were red hot under his tongue, and keep it there the ultimate shame secret of the ruler of the land. It struggled to blurt itself out whenever he opened his mouth. It made him sweat and often gasp aloud, or strangle a groan to a sigh, or wake up in the middle of the silent night, certain he had just yelled it out at the top of his voice to the whole city. He knew this poor barber, he had to spit it out somehow. In the lawn of a park, he lifted a turf after midnight. He kneeled there and whispered into the raw hole, Asses' ears, Midas has asses' ears. Then fitted the turf back, trod flat the grave of that insup pressable gossip, and went off singing under his breath. But in no time, as if the barber had grafted it there from some far-off reed bed, a clump of reeds bunched out from that very sod. It looked strange on the park lawn, but sounded stranger. Every gust brought an articulate whisper out of the bending stalk. At every puff they betrayed the barber's confidence, broadcasting the buried secret, hissing to all who happened to be passing, Asses' ears, Midas has asses' ears.'